Today's the day when people usually post videos about something that didn't happen. I'm going to tell you about something that's real, but sounds fake. In Germany in 2015, the carbonated soft drink Fanta was celebrating its 75th anniversary with a television ad that went like this. Deutsche Ikone wird 75 Jahre alt. Und um das zu feiern, bringen wir das Gefühl der guten alten Zeit zurück mit der neuen Fanta Classic. When this aired, some Germans started doing some back-of-the-napkin calculations. The ad harkened back to the quote, good old days. 2015 minus 75 leaves you with 1940. The good old days were the good old days of the Third Reich. The ad was subsequently and quickly pulled. This is the story of the German Coca-Cola company, in German called Die Coca-Cola Gesellschaft mit beschränkter Haftung, basically German for limited liability company. It's the story of the Nazi collaboration of Coca-Cola GmbH and the collaborator who invented Fanta. German soft drinks were not very common in the period. Non-alcoholic beverages were considered syrupy concoctions for children. Although soft drinks weren't widespread in Germany, breweries didn't like the idea of competing with Coca-Cola for the go-to cold refreshment drink. Some competitors spread rumors that Coca-Cola contained cocaine, which might have deterred some German consumers. And others complained that Coca-Cola contained no cocaine, which possibly deterred other customers. Then there was the fact that a member of the board, Harold Hirsch, was Jewish, which became a problem in Nazi Germany for obvious reasons. Despite all these challenges and many others I'll mention, Coca-Cola managed to thrive in Nazi Germany. In 1929, four years before Hitler came to power, the American expatriate Ray Rivington Powers started bottling German Coca-Cola. Powers managed to boost sales from, quote, just under 6,000 cases to over 100,000 in 1933. Though the charismatic Ray Powers had boosted sales from nothing to something, German Coca-Cola quickly fell into disarray due to his financial incompetence. And from that chaos emerged a new corporation called Coca-Cola GmbH. The man in charge of fixing the financial mess was Max Kite. Men laughed with Ray Powers, but trembled before Max Kite. Kite was an imposing figure with a mustache and temper like the Fuhrer himself. Mark Pendergrast, author of For God, Country and Coca-Cola, goes to great lengths to make parallels between Max Kite and Adolf Hitler, portraying Max Kite sort of like the Hitler of soft drinks. Side note, I'm not providing a picture of Max Kite because I don't know what he looks like. If you google Max Kite, you'll see this man, likely sourced to this Medium article. You'll also see his face adorning thumbnails for videos about the invention of Fanta. That is not Max Kite. That's Robert Woodruff, president of the parent company Coca-Cola at the time. A lot of people did not do enough research, but that happens sometimes. In Germany, Coca-Cola and Hitler rose hand in hand. Pendergrass specifies that though Kite deserves some of the credit for this, he himself recognized that, quote, time marched with us, meaning technological developments and infrastructure developments in refrigeration and automobiles made the proliferation of Coca-Cola throughout the Reich that much easier. In 1933, they had sold 100,000 cases of Coca-Cola. In 1939, they sold 4.5 million. By 1939, there were 43 German Coke bottling plants. There were also 600 independent franchisees, which Pendergrass describes in the following way. Each was his own mini-führer, though bowing ultimately to Max Kite, who had made it all possible for them. Come the Berlin Olympics of 1936, Coca-Cola was prominently on display. Goering and Goebbels hosted the president of Coca-Cola, who had come all the way from Atlanta, Georgia, a man named Robert Woodruff head of the parent company of German Coca-Cola. While he was in Berlin, Ray Power's section of the German Coca-Cola industry was dissolved, and Max Kite was made sole Geschäftsführer of Coca-Cola GmbH. In exchange, Ray Powers was promised a flat royalty fee for all drinks sold in Germany until 1950. Upon the commencement of the German four-year plan, imports were curtailed, and Coca-Cola had to scramble to try to secure its supply of Coca-Cola concentrate. Quoting Pendergrast, with war clouds darkening, these titans of American industry quietly maneuvered to protect themselves against all contingencies. Some, like Henry Ford, were in fact Nazi sympathizers, while others, such as Walter Teagle of Standard Oil, avoided taking sides but saw nothing wrong with doing business with the Nazis. Like his friend and hunting companion Teagle, Woodruff practiced expediency. His politics were Coca-Cola, pure and simple. I'd like to add and clarify that this means Woodruff's politics were Coca-Cola, even if that meant their subsidiary, which his company owned a majority share in, were closely linked to the Nazis. His politics were capitalism, and capitalism chases profit. At the end of the day, it's not so much concerned about where and how that profit is generated. In March 1938, during the Anschluss of Austria, quote, Far from expressing horror at Nazi aggression, Kite and his men swiftly followed the troops into Austria, establishing a Vienna branch in September. Kite registered no protest a month later when on November 10, 1938, Kristallnacht heralded a new level of terror for Jews. His Austrian businesses were demolished and synagogues set on fire. Nor were Woodruff or Powers disturbed. This did cause some conflict between the pioneer of German Coca-Cola Ray Powers and the president of Coca-Cola proper, as Ray Powers had been promised royalties from all sales in Germany, and Germany had just become a lot larger. He reasoned he should get royalties from these territories as well. Of note, Ray Powers was an admirer of Hitler, and in 1936 he ended a letter to his boss, Robert Woodruff, with the words Heil Hitler. 
Powerson would have managed to come to a settlement regarding the royalties, but shortly after, Powerson's car was hit by a 15-ton truck and he died. With the outbreak of war with France and England upon the invasion of Poland in 1939, Kite feared that the Nazis would nationalize Coca-Cola as it was a foreign business. A lot of people imagined the Nazi economic policy in regards to big business being one of total control and nationalization. This was not the case. Adam Tooze says, Virtually in every context, even settings in which one might have expected some resistance, the regime's political representatives found active collaborators in German business. Hitler is famous for having said that there was no need to nationalize German businesses if the population itself could be nationalized. In order to preempt nationalization or other problems that they foresaw, Kite and his legal representative Oppenhoff worked to become a part of the German bureaucracy. Quoting Pendergast, Oppenhoff managed to get the two of them appointed to the Office of Enemy Property to supervise all soft drink plants, both in Germany and in occupied territory. As the war progressed, Kite's Coca-Cola GmbH took over Coca-Cola in Italy, France, Holland, Luxembourg, Belgium, and Norway. With the war raging, the secret ingredient to create Coca-Cola could no longer easily be imported from America, and with America's entry into the war in 1941, the import stopped completely. This brings us to Kite's masterstroke plan to deal with the lack of supply to create his products. By combining whey, a byproduct of cheese making, and apple fiber from cider presses, they created what Kite later called a drink made of leftovers from leftovers. Supposedly during a contest for the name, Kite asked his employers to let their fantasy run wild, and veteran salesman Joe Knipp immediately blurted out the winning name, Fanta. In Belgium, the name ended up being called Cappy because Fanta sounded too Germanic to the occupied Belgian populace. In 1941, the drink was exempted from wartime sugar rationing and was allowed to use 3.5% real sugar. As a result, many bottles which were sold were not bought for drinking, but to be used to sweeten cooking, as the regular German populace did not have access to sugar in the same way that the German Coca-Cola company did. Capitalists tend to find a way. Speaking of finding a way, as the labor force dried up and more and more of Kite's workers were drafted for the war, Kite found new workers. Chinese laborers and, quote, people who would come from anywhere in Europe. The war brought them from everywhere. This sounds like they came willingly, but this likely referred to Fremdarbeiter or Ostarbeiter, foreign laborers conscripted to work for starvation wages in German factories to replace the lost German labor force. Pendergrast isn't clear about when Kite started utilizing foreign slave labor and only refers to, quote, later in the war. According to Adam Tooze, in industrial manufacturing, the balance between costs of inmate labor as specified by the fees paid to the SS, from whom you got the labor, and the productivity of average inmate workers was very favorable to the employer. In other words, slave labor was profitable, though there's evidence to suggest that had they been available, employers would have preferred German workers employed under less coercive circumstances as they were more productive. If by later in the war, Pendergrass means after 1943, then there's a fair chance that the foreign workers employed by the Coca-Cola plants were not worked to death. That they may not have labored their workers to death is the best thing I can say about them in this situation. In July and August 1943, quote, only 2,300 Ostarbeiter, meaning civilian forced laborers usually from the Soviet Union, died out of a population of 1.6 million. Though it should be mentioned that this was still twice the mortality of the German population, so conditions were certainly not good. With six months left of the war, the general in charge of the Ministry of Commerce had decided to nationalize Coca-Cola and demanded that Kite change the name to something else. Quote, call it Max Kite GmbH if you want but change it within two days or you will be placed in a concentration camp. Kite stalled and was intending to confront the general at the deadline, but luckily for him, the general was killed in an air raid on the very same day of the deadline. Three months later, the Führer was dead and the Third Reich had collapsed. But Kite's Reich, Coca-Cola GmbH, would survive. By the end of the war, Kite became a hero to the executives of Coca-Cola, the man who had kept Coca-Cola alive in Germany. When technical observers found Max Kite, he was allegedly bottling Fanta in a half-destroyed plant. Technical observers were Coca-Cola company men who were sent along U.S. soldiers to every part of the world to ensure that the troops always had access to Coca-Cola. They were given a pseudo-military status and military rank commensurate with company pay, leading some to call them Coca-Cola colonels. And they wore army uniforms with the letters T.O. on a shoulder patch. During the war, T.O.s helped set up 64 Coca-Cola bottling plants overseas wherever American troops went, largely at government expense. And by the end of the war, those plants were still there and the local populace had been introduced to the company's products. According to the American GI Museum.org, two technical observers were even returned home in flag draped caskets. Kite had to contend with the technical observers from Coca Cola proper now being in charge of the Coke in his plants, while he was allowed to bottle Fanta. In an effort to regain control of his company, Kite encouraged his former employees to join the ranks of the technical observers. And before too long, his former comrades, ex Nazis, and collaborator friends once again worked the Coca Cola plants of Germany. Through Kite's cunning and business acumen, alongside President Woodruff's decree that bottling should be returned to the natives, Kite was in charge of Coca-Cola in Germany again in 1949. And he proclaimed, Coca-Cola ist wieder da. 
Coca-Cola is back. Pendergrass says, quote, Max Kite was now Coca-Cola commander throughout Europe. Braver bottlers in hushed tones called him Superfuhrer. Quoting from God, Country, and Coca-Cola, Chapter 13, Coca-Cola über alles. In early 1945, a group of German prisoners of war debarked in Hoboken, New Jersey, apprehensive and lonely in a foreign land. When one of them pointed to a Coca-Cola sign on a nearby building, the prisoners began excitedly gesticulating and talking among themselves. Taken aback, the guard yelled for order, demanding an explanation from a prisoner who spoke English. We are surprised, he answered, that you have Coca-Cola here too. While the soft drink came to symbolize American freedom, all the good things back home the GI was fighting for, the same Coca-Cola logo rested comfortably next to the swastika. To round us out, this isn't a debunking video, but I happened upon a Snopes fact check from 2004 on the idea that Fanta was invented by the Nazis. The claim, Fanta was invented by the Nazis, which Snopes rates as false. Fanta was invented in Germany when the war made it difficult to get Coca-Cola syrup from the USA to Germany. Now, it wasn't just syrup, there were other ingredients, which is why I guess Snopes says this is closest to the truth. The article quotes a passage from Frederick Allen's book, Secret Formula, the 1994 edition specifically. Allen's book is a lot less critical of figures like Ray Powers, Robert Woodruff, and Max Kite. From the content, the Snopes article seems to lean heavily on Allen's account in his book, despite citing only four pages from it. Meanwhile, they also cite 13 pages from Pendergast's book, while leaving out key details that are found within those pages from the article's narrative. My problem with the article is its conclusion. Quote, the truth is simple, even if it doesn't run trippingly off the tongue. Fanta was the creation of a German-born Coca-Cola man who was acting without direction from Atlanta. This man wasn't a Nazi, nor did he invent the drink at the direction of the Third Reich. Rather, in an effort to preserve Coca-Cola company assets and protect its people by way of keeping local plants operating, he formulated a new soft drink when it became impossible to produce the company's flagship product. Now, on the surface, most of this is true. The problem comes with what you admit. Max Kite was not a member of the Nazi party, but he carried favor with the Nazi regime and angled for positions of power that allowed him to seize control of foreign bottling plants in occupied territories. Max Kite registered no protest at the mistreatment of Jews or Nazi aggression, and used foreign forced labor from occupied territories to keep his factories afloat. If Max Kite was protecting his people by keeping the bottling plants running, he was doing so at the cost of Ukrainians, Poles, and others who were imported into the heart of the Reich to work for, at times, starvation wages. Max Kite hitched Coca-Cola to the Nazi regime because it meant profits. Quoting Mark Pendergast, As young men goose-stepped in formation at Hitler Youth rallies, Coca-Cola trucks accompanied the marchers hoping to capture the next generation. The Snopes article mentions how Kite's loyalty was investigated following the war. One post-war Coca-Cola technical observer named George Downing had flatly called Kite, quote, a second Hitler. Downing didn't like Kite, or how he as a German, in a defeated Germany, ordered Americans around. Downing was convinced that Kite had originally planned to take over Coca-Cola's worldwide operations had the war gone differently. Max Kite was not a committed Nazi, but he was a Nazi collaborator. Kite was also a pragmatic capitalist. His goal wasn't Aryan Europe, his goal was profit. He might have preferred it if those profits were a little more, so to say, ethical, and did not come as a result of forced labor and territorial conquest. But he also preferred the profit to no profit. Quoting Pendergast, Through cunning, bluff, intimidation, wheedling, influence, marketing, and sheer willpower, Max Kite survived along with his beloved drink. For Kite, as one aide put it, the ruling thought was not Deutschland über alles, but Coca-Cola über alles. Thanks for watching, and thank you to the patrons. If you'd like to see videos early and have your name credited at the end of the video, you can find my Patreon link below.